Good afternoon, everyone. No matter who we are and what our beliefs are, whether we are Bible students or not, we have all heard of Jerusalem. It is one of the oldest cities in the world, and it's always in the news. It has an extremely important part in the history of the world and the future, and in prophecy. It's the capital of Israel, and going back into the, in the Bible to Genesis. Jerusalem is mentioned 660 times in the Old Testament, as Zion 158, and 146 times in the New Testament, and as Zion 7. It is known as the center of the world, as location. And Jews around the world face Israel when they are praying. In Israel, when they're in Israel, they face Jerusalem. And if they're in Jerusalem, they face the Temple Mount. Can you close your eyes and imagine a world completely free from fear, poverty, violence, a world with widespread peace and goodwill towards men? free from the worries of everyday life. The time is coming. Acts 3 and 19 and 20 talks of the times of refreshing shall come from the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, and God shall send Jesus Christ. From ancient times until the present, Jerusalem has been one of the most sought after cities in the world, and it continues to be so. Today, perhaps more than any other time in history, people, groups, and nations dispute whom Jerusalem should belong to. And why is this city so important? Jerusalem in the heart of God. The most decisive statements regarding the importance of Jerusalem are found in the Bible, which states that Jerusalem is the city of God and the city of the great king. It's in Psalm 48. Zechariah 3 and 2 says that the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He has chosen to dwell on Mount Zion forever. And according to uh, Psalm 68, this is my first, excuse me, this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. I have desired it. Because he claims this mountain as his home, God is very jealous for Jerusalem. He tells us, I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt, in Zechariah 1 and 14. Though men of ancient days have placed their own nations at the center of the world maps, Ezekiel 5 and 5 says, Jerusalem is the center of nations and of the earth. And thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. So no other city can claim this divine placement in the eyes of God. And it seems natural that since God will reign from Jerusalem, the enemy will do whatever he can to hold on to whatever power he has and move against his plan for salvation. Nevertheless, it stands tall in its calling to be a light to the nations as a shining city on a hill. And Jerusalem is in the plan of God Many prophecies have been pronounced over Jerusalem. Some have already been fulfilled, but others are yet to be. For example, in Jeremiah 3 and 17, he promises that the nations will gather to worship him in Jerusalem. And at that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. Despite this glorious future, or perhaps because of it, Jerusalem is in a continuous battle. We learn in Zechariah 12 that God intends to make Jerusalem a cup of reeling for the surrounding nations, and a heavy, immovable rock for the nations that gather against her. This will culminate in the war of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38 and 4 says that God would put hooks in the mouth of Gog, the leader or coalition of nations, who will draw them all into a war against Israel. Of course, we are already seeing things or signs of this as the international community continues to come against Israel, and more specifically, Jerusalem. On April 4th of 1950, just two years after Israel became a nation, the UN's General Assembly passed the Statute of the City of Jerusalem, 
which establishes guidelines and regulations for ruling Jerusalem as an international regime. If this United Nations resolution were to be enforced, it would be a game changer. However, in 1980, the Israel Knesset, or Parliament, passed the Jerusalem Law declaring Jerusalem as the eternal, undivided capital of Israel. And a few thousand years ago, in Psalm 48 and 8, declared Jerusalem to be the city of the Lord, but not just any Lord. The Lord is specifically identified by the covenant name of the Most High God, first revealed to Moses, Yahweh. And we find through the Psalms and prophets that Jerusalem is called the city of Yahweh. Daniel also tells us that the city and its people are called by his name. And in Isaiah 60 and 14, we are told that Jerusalem is called Zion of the Holy One of Israel. No, other, no God other than the God of Abraham can claim Jerusalem as their own, and no other people group can claim Jerusalem as their inheritance except those who have called the God of Israel, Yahweh, their Lord. Lord Jesus Christ is coming to be king over all the earth. He predicted this himself as his first advent, at his first advent. The Jews expected Christ to come as a king then. They did not understand that he then came as the Lamb of God to open the way to life eternal by providing a sacrifice for sin. And so they played their part in the purpose of God by crucifying him. But in instructing his disciples regarding his impending death, he said, I will come again. This is before his death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. His teaching was endorsed by angels when he did ascend to heaven, for two such told the apostles in Acts 1 and 11, the same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And Jesus Christ is coming to set up on earth a divine kingdom which shall absorb all other powers and over which he will reign. We see these references in Daniel 2 and 44. The God of heaven shall set up a king that shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to the other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And under Christ's rule, conditions on the earth will dramatically change. War will be outlawed, sin will be restrained, vice will be suppressed, and men will acknowledge the majesty of the Creator and the benefits of His way of life. There shall be glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. When Christ comes again and takes over the rule of the earth, it will never again go back into the hands of corrupt men. Before his birth, it was foretold, which we have heard many times, in Luke 1, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. So the Bible sh clearly shows that all this will take place on earth, and that Jerusalem, the ancient capital of David's kingdom, will become the metropolis of Christ's world rule. The city in which Christ will reign will be different from the Jerusalem of today, but will be acknowledged as the city of truth, in Zechariah 8 and 3, and the joy of the whole earth, in Psalm 48 and 2. The decrees and laws of King Jesus will penetrate into every corner of the earth to be implemented with power. They will solve the political, moral, social, and religious problems of today. Mankind will be united as never before under an entirely new system of things on the earth. Jerusalem will not only become the political center of Christ's reign on earth, but his religious headquarters also. It will become a great temple city, a place where all mankind will be united in a common acceptance of divine truth, by which they will learn to view matters from the standpoint of God. 
This formed part of the teaching of the Lord during his first advent, or his first appearance. Several times during his ministry, he visited the temple in Jerusalem. And on one occasion, he found the outer court thronged with traders gathered together to make profit from sales to the worshipers. Their action destroyed the very principle of divine service. Full of indignation at such desecration of such a holy place, he scathingly rebuked the guilty traders, and as it is in Mark 11, 15 through 17, Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be a call, be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it into a den of thieves. So this incident is well known to many people, but the significance of his words are usually overlooked. As we just read, he taught, saying unto them, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. So he has identified the temple in Jerusalem as his house, and taught that the time will come when all nations shall recognize it as such. The time hasn't come yet. Forty years after Christ spoke the words quoted above, the Romans waged war upon the Jews. They overthrew the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and took the people captive. And later a Muslim mosque was built upon the site of the ancient temple and remains there until this day. For Christ's words to be fulfilled, that mosque, called the Dome of the Rock, must be replaced by a temple which will become the center of worldwide worship in truth. On another occasion, Christ predicted that the temple of his day would be completely destroyed. And that was Luke 21 and 6. And that Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In his prediction, He said that first, the temple would be destroyed. Second, Jerusalem would be overthrown. Third, the Jewish people would be taken into captivity. The Jewish nation again restored. Jerusalem delivered from the foreign domination and the temple rebuilt to become the center of universal worship. So the first three points were fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the Jewish state. The fourth was partially fulfilled in 1948 when the Jewish state was reformed. And the fifth had part fulfillment in 1967 as a result of the Six Days War. The city of Jerusalem was again occupied by the Jewish people. And the last, the temple being rebuilt, has never been fulfilled as yet and awaits Christ's return. In Christ's day, the temple in Jerusalem was exclusively for Jewish worship. But in the future, it will constitute a house of prayer for all nations. Both Jews and Gentiles will worship there. The former because they will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. And the latter because they will acknowledge their Messiah as King of the Jews. The veil of darkness at present over the eyes of both Jews and Gentiles will be removed and all nations will accept the truth in Christ Jesus. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity and things wherein there is no profit. And at the same time, the deliverer shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. How will that be accomplished? By the divine worship to be set up in Jerusalem at Christ's coming. That's in Micah 4. When Jesus returns to the earth, there will be a resurrection of the dead. In Daniel 12 and 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
Concerning those who attain unto eternal life, it is said, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Where will the immortal redeemed reign with Christ? Some claim it will be in heaven, but the Bible shows it will be on earth. We are told that he will occupy the throne of his father David in Luke 1 and 32, and that throne was in Jerusalem. And it will be in that city where Christ will establish the nucleus of his earthly rule. Zechariah declares that he shall be king over all the earth. So we know that the Lord is to return personally and visibly to the earth. The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as we read before. He will raise from the dead and bestow immortality on those who have lived according to his precepts. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Whereas in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterwards they that are Christ that is coming. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on immortality. He will destroy the mighty or the military might of the nations. He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations far off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So Micah 4. The nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. That's Isaiah 60. He will redeem the land of Israel from violence. Violence shall no more be heard in, any, in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. A vast change from the troubled Middle East of today. Men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And he will set up his power in Jerusalem. The Lord shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. He will proclaim his law from Jerusalem for the obedience of all nations. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. A law shall proceed from me and I will make my judgments to rest for a light of the people. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. He will completely restore scattered Israel and regenerate the nation as the nucleus of his world power. Behold, I will save thy people from the east and from the west, and I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. He will supervise the building of a glorious temple in Jerusalem as a center of universal worship. Behold the man whose name is the branch, a title of Christ, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon this throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And as you see in Isaiah, mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people or all nations. And representatives of the nations will make constant pilgrimage to Jerusalem for worship. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek him. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before him. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. 
All flesh shall come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And then this will result in 1,000 years of peace on earth with humanity delivered from the problems and frustrations of today, as we see happening around us daily. They, the immortalized redeemed, shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him over the immortal populations of the earth a thousand years. Glory to God in the highest and on eth on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. Thy kingdom come, that thy will may be done in earth as it is in heaven. In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have the dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. He shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that not hath no helper. He shall redeem their souls from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. That's Psalm 72. These passages that we have looked at emphasize that the earth is the arena of God's future purpose with humanity, and that his plan envisages a time when present conditions will be replaced by a divine order, the kingdom of God on earth. Christ shall return to set up his power and reign from Jerusalem. Christ's return will synchronize with a period of extreme international trouble. Daniel predicts that there will be a time of trouble such as never was in Daniel 2, excuse me, Daniel 12. And surely we are experiencing the premonitions of that in the developing world problems of the moment. His first work will be to resurrect those for judgment and then reward with immortality those believers who have obeyed his precepts. Then with almighty power, he will compel the nations to submit to his rule. He must reign, taught Paul in 1 Corinthians, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. When Christ has triumphed over the present rulers of a spiritually dark and evil age, when every social, political, moral, and ecclesiastical evil has been suppressed, a man's power brought into subjection to that of Christ's. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill towards men will result, which is what we're looking for. As creator, all honor and glory is due and fitting to him whose dominion is from everlasting to everlasting. Food, clothing, shelter, health, strength, every lungful of the life-giving air we breathe, even life itself comes from him. Praise and adoration of God, therefore, is the fundamental characteristic of all who would serve Christ even now. It will be the prevailing principle of the age when Christ rules in the earth. It will be reflected particularly in the services to be conducted in the great temple to be erected in Jerusalem under the supervision of Christ. That house of prayer for all nations, to which he made reference when he visited the temple, Christ's universal rule will be dispense, dispensing with war so that peace will at last prevail, something that we all look forward to. He will introduce a new economic system providing adequate opportunity for all. We read, Merchandise and hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. It's in Isaiah 23. His divine system, which will provide for man's material needs as well as his spiritual requirements, shall eliminate want and rivalry, it will dispense justice and mercy towards all without partiality. The new educational system based on divine truth will replace the present inadequate system. Children will be taught the fear and admonition of the Lord, with the result that juvenile delinquency shall de cease Every evil traffic, every degrading vice will be eradicated. The vile person shall be no more called liberal, nor the churl said to be bountiful, Isaiah 32. 
Moreover, Christ's second coming should not be considered as something that might take place in the remote future. The signs that it is near and at hand are clear and obvious. Preeminently among those is the sign of Israel. The Bible plainly predicts the restoration of the Jews to their land and the modern revival of the nation of Israel as a sign of Christ's coming. We have the threefold prophecy of Ezekiel in uh, Ezekiel 37. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land and make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. The prophecy requires three developmental stages. First, the return of the people. Second, the revival of the nation. And third, the restoration of the monarchy. Two parts of the prophecy have had token fulfillment, and we await the third. Who is the promised king? Listen to the message of God given to Mary, the mother of the Lord, in Luke 1. Thou shalt bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him unto him the throne of his father David. There shall reign over that house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there shall be no end. So in this clear language, it requires the preservation of the Jews, Jacob, as a people and the revival as a nation in preparation for Christ's return. In another place, the statement is made, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory, Psalm 102. And again, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first in Jeremiah 33. How completely at variance is this statement of scripture with the teaching of those who claim that the revival of Israel has no part in the purpose of God. At the first, Israel constituted a nation of 12 tribes with its capital in Jerusalem, where was found the throne of David. If Christ is to be given the throne of his father David as promised, it must be restored again. And that is exactly what is to follow the return of Christ to the earth. In Acts 15, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. In short, Christ will return to establish his power in Jerusalem as the nucleus of his rule that will extend to the ends of the earth. The Jews, at present, in the land will be humbled and disciplined and compelled to accept the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. Thus will be fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 12 and 10, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn as one mourneth for his only son. They shall mourn at their past blindness, the folly and ignorance that led them to reject their Messiah. Their Repentance shall lead to their conversion and the forgiveness of their past sins and a new covenant in Christ. And if we open our eyes to the miracle of the Middle East, the remarkable events that are taking place in that historic land testify to the truth of the prophetic scriptures, proclaim to all who have ears to hear that Christ's return is at hand. Today, Israel occupies an increasingly important place in the councils of the world's governments. And though it is now obvious that the Jews are in the land to stay, people little realize the full significance of what there is in taking place. Israel is more than just a Jewish foothold in the Middle East. It is a movement destined to have world-shaking consequences and to drastically affect the way of life of every person on the earth. The remarkable revival of Israel, in spite of all obstacles it has had to surmount and the bitter opposition that it has experienced, is the greatest miracle of modern times. At present, however, Israel comprises only a tiny strip of territory along the Mediterranean seaboard with a population of about 8,855,000. 
Um, through incredible hardship and unremitting toil, a measure of fertility has been brought to the one-time arid soil. And while this is a fulfillment of viral prophecy, is only a token of the full restoration of Israel predicted therein, the fulfillment of which awaits Christ's return. As the Apostle Paul spoke in Romans 11, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob so that all Israel will be saved. And that all Israel meaning the tribes. By this restoration of its ancient political constitution, the nation will be completely rebuilt as at the first. As it was when divided into 12 tribes, so it will be when restored to its former status under Christ. The regathered people will be separated into 12 tribes and established in the land as outlined in the last chapter of Ezekiel's prophecy. The nation has never been established in the land as it is there described a further evidence showing that it must yet be so. So when that takes place, it will be placed under the authority of the 12 resurrected and glorified apostles. The Lord Jesus has promised them. In Matthew 19 and 28, ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Where will Christ be at that time? At the cost of repetition, we again state that the throne of his glory is the ancient throne of David restored, and that it will be located in the city of Jerusalem, where it existed previously. So that city will become the city of the great king, to be acknowledged as the throne of the Lord, from where he will reign as king over all the earth. He will not rule in a single isolated splendor. He will have his associates his resurrected and glorified followers. In Revelation 5, 9 and 10, we find the redeemed of all ages singing the glory of Christ and saying, For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So Christ's followers will comprise a royal priesthood in the age to come designed to draw all mankind to God in the millennium of peace and glory, yet to be manifested in the earth. A royal priesthood requires a royal temple. The center of Christ's administration will be in Jerusalem. The city will be changed from what it is today, however, and comprise a temple city, the center of world worship. It shall become the rallying point for the nations, uniting them in one common belief, one universal law, one ideal. International antagonism will cease, religious controversy will give place to truth, and diverse races will worship together in universal adoration and the submission of God to God. The last chapters of Ezekiel's prophecy describe this temple in such detail to draw the ground, excuse me. When the Hebrew measures are converted to English equivalents, there is presented a building of such magnitude and beauty as to exceed anything the world has ever seen. And the late Henry Sully, an architect of Nottingham, England, drew these plans. It provides for a mile square house of prayer set in the center of a 50 mile square reservation in the center of the land of promise called the Holy Oblation, meaning the portion set aside for divine use. This will be entirely separated from the surrounding country for the purpose of worship. The Bible declares in Zechariah 14, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem at Armageddon shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. And again, the Jerusalem to which these worshipers will ascend will be entirely different from that of today. Gone will be the impurities and rubbish of the centuries covered over by a tremendous earthquake that will elevate Mount Zion in Jerusalem while leveling the surrounding country. And around this elevated mount will be 
will a new Jerusalem be built to the Lord. Zion will be encircled by a range of buildings some 200 feet wide, 200 feet high, and two and three quarter miles in circumference. This imposing structure will be beautifully beautified by tall, massive pillars and facades of arabesque masonry, upon which will creep the luxurious growth of vines and creepers. This vast circular range of buildings, beautiful in appearance, majestic in design, sig significant in spiritual symbolism, and reflecting to the glory of its divine architect will constitute the temple proper. Mortal subjects of Christ's kingdom, as distinct from those who elect to follow Christ now, and who then will be his immortal associates, will be congregated in the areas set aside for their use. And the vast corner courts of the outer square range of buildings, which will enclose the circular temple. From there, they will be able to view the elevated altar, and also see the king himself surrounded by his glorious, immortalized friends. They will constitute the royal priesthood appointed to rule the nations in equity and educate them in righteousness. As priests, they will officiate in the worship. Their voices will be raised in anthems of praise and thanksgiving to the Creator, their Father, and their strength. Even now, the contemplation of the reality of Christ's coming rule can draw us closer to Him, so providing it can help us visualize the future and clothe it with reality, so providing an incentive for godly living. It will enable us to see beyond the evil present to the glorious consummation of God's plan with earth and man. Many Bible verses shine with new significance when considering the light of this theme. Psalm 22, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. In Isaiah 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people will say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and he will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift sword against nation anymore. That is the glorious future awaiting this earth. When Christ reigns from Jerusalem and the world is united in the worship that will stem from the temple to be effected there. It is a picture that can inspire us with hope and anticipation in the spirit of darkness and distress, in spite of the darkness and distress of the present. <laughs>